Hello and welcome to the Bookshelf series, where we at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore look at books pertinent to the study of contemporary South Asia. I'm your host, Dr. Yogesh Joshi, and today we have with us Professor Kanti Prasad Bajpai to discuss with us his recent book on Sino-Indian relations titled India versus China, Why They Are Not Friends. Professor Bajpai is the director, Center on Asia and Globalization, and Wilma Professor of Asian Studies at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. One of the most prolific scholars and original thinkers of international relations in the region, his interests include international security, Indian foreign policy, and national security. Before coming to the LKY School, he was Professor of International Politics at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and Professor in the Politics and International Relations of South Asia, Oxford University. From 2003 to 2009, he was also headmaster of the Doon School, uh, India. He has held visiting appointments at Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, John B. Brock Institute for Peace, Notre Dame University, the Brookings Institution, and the Australian Defense Forces Academy. Most recently, he was Distinguished Fellow, Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. He also writes a regular column for Times of India, New Delhi. For me personally, he has been a great mentor. Kanti, welcome to the Bookshelf series. Thanks so much for joining us. Yogesh, thanks very much for doing this. And thanks to ISAS for organizing it. It's a pleasure. Uh, so let's just delve into the book, uh, which I found extremely interesting uh, and learned a lot out of. Uh, and a quick read, lucid read, you know, so uh, you never mind that uh, when thoughts come across to you very, uh, you know, uh, cogently. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for uh, you know, doing that for all of us. Uh, you have watched the Sino-Indian relations for a long time, but the publication of the book is so timely, especially when it's seen in the light of the 2020 border crisis and the ongoing global pandemic and their impact on Sino-Indian relations. Could you share some of the underlying motivations behind your keen interest in the trajectory of Sino-Indian relations and this book in particular? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I think the first point to be made is that uh, actually, I didn't come up with the idea of the book at all. It was uh, Jagannath Books, uh, my publisher, uh, Chiki Sarkar and, uh, and Nandini Mehta. And, uh, you know, I always need a kick in the pants to get going on something. And so that's what they did. Um, and they put it to me that it was timely for exactly the reasons that you mentioned, the crisis, of course. But I think the larger point they made, which appealed to me, was that um, there's the literature, obviously, on Sino-Indian relations, which is quite robust and extensive. But it falls into certain boxes, which um, I think they wanted to transcend. So of course, there's a lot of stuff on the border problem. Um, and secondly, relations between the two countries since about the 1980s. I mean, I think uh, there's a vast literature there, a lot of it sitting in the bookshelves just behind me. And then secondly, or thirdly, there's you know, a breaking news kind of analysis that's rampant in the press, in uh, the electronic media, in magazines and journals and so on. So, uh, which is very important. But again, I mean, you know, it's too close to the events, including last year's. And so um, they wanted uh, uh, me to try and lift the, the perspective beyond that immediate horizon. I think the, the other point that we wanted to transcend is kind of very partisan writings. I mean, I think uh, particularly we're talking about English writings on China-India relations. Um, and they're mostly in India, but also in the West, uh, to some extent in China, but they tend to be very partisan. Uh, and so, again, there were, we felt there was a need for uh, a, a book that tried to be as balanced as possible. I mean, nobody can be completely balanced, uh, but uh, to try and do that. And I think finally, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that is advocacy. Uh, India should do this, particularly, or China should do that, less so perhaps in the English language. And so we, I particularly, I think the publishers would have been happy with it, but I wanted to avoid too much advocacy again. And so I think that's where the book comes from. Yeah, which is very much evident in the introduction of the book, where you basically outline, uh, you know, uh, in a sense that you're going to be objective uh, as much as you can. So definitely, you know, in that sense, it's a, it's a welcome contribution. Let's delve into the book itself. Uh, so very early in the book, you cajole the reader to uncover deeper sources of conflict in which the two societies have embroiled themselves without any recourse to successful extrication. One of those factors is the clash of perceptions. Uh, would you please explain how perceptions complicate the nature of Sino-Indian relations? Uh, but taking forward, you know, moving forward, 
What was most striking in your narration, at least to me, is the clash of their worldviews. Uh, and you outlined uh, the worldviews of both India and, uh, India and China. Uh, do you think that there is no space for mutual accommodation in the perceptive logic of Indian and the Chinese state? Well, I mean, coming back to the first issue, which is perceptions, I mean, I think it's sad that, uh, but it's just a historical kind of artifact that uh, from about the late 19th century, on the Chinese side particularly, I mean, pretty negative views of India. Uh, these came out of the fact that, you know, there were Indians in China uh, working for the British in the police, in the, the military, the Indian traders, who sometimes the Chinese thought behaved badly and exploited local people. Um, there was, of course, the opium trade that the British kind of forced on China pretty much, and that, again, became very controversial, um, and India's associated with that too, um, uh, whether willingly or unwillingly at that time. And so I think, you know, out of that came a, a sort of almost popular view of, of India as being a negative. But in addition, as I show in the book, and, I, you know, I, I ought to say that the book is completely synthetic. I mean, uh, my book depends completely on research that's already out there. I don't pretend to have gone to the archive and done massive original work, but there's so much good work that one can draw on. And one of the other sources of sort of negative Chinese perceptions was that a group of uh, intellectuals uh, uh, who were uh, looking to avoid the Indian fate for China. India had been conquered by the British and had become in the view of these Chinese intellectuals and reformists, a supine uh, civilization under a great civilization that had become supine. And they looked at India and drew the lesson, this is not what we want to become. And this is as China was falling under the, uh, the, the sort of jackboots of uh, Europeans. And so, you know, they, they threw uh, the views of, of writers in Japan and uh, Europeans who had looked at India. And indeed, the, the Japanese analyses of India came from Europeans as well. Um, saw India as a kind of, you know, this timeless civilization that hadn't moved on, that hadn't modernized, that had fallen to, to you know, uh, kind of uh, the British, and that it was fatally divided um, uh, between religions and castes and, and so on, and so could not stand up. And so I think that's the origins of a kind of looking down their noses at, at India, really, which predates uh, Mao and the communists and all of that. And of course, on the Indian side, there's been a sense of kind of civilizational arrogance as well, um, coming out of various strands of, you know, uh, again, racism and jingoism uh, on, the, on our side. And so I think, you know, this is quite a potent uh, base on which uh, the, the two sets of perceptions rest. And uh, neither side has managed to altogether, you know, kind of transcend it. I think that, you know, uh, uh, it's been quite nice in these uh, podcasts uh, someone said to me, yeah, but I think the Chinese use it, addressing the Chinese side of it. Uh, the Chinese have, through their official propaganda and so on, are, are trying very instrumentally uh, at the governmental level to portray India in this very negative way. Um, and I think this is a point that I missed in the book, which I think probably has some credence. That is, uh, there's a kind of instrumental effort to downplay India, to look down upon India, and it seems to hide a bit of a worry that actually India might someday come to rival China, uh, that it has strengths and that, you know, India might come to, uh, to shine and even overtake. Uh, so this is what I call, not in the book, but what I would call here, kind of superiority, inferiority complex. You know, so superiority that China is this very organized, put together uh, civilization and form of governance and India is the opposite. It seems to be the Chinese telling themselves this um, because they have a kind of worry that India might catch up and someday even uh, overtake them. And I think there's something of that in India as well, uh, that uh, India has this kind of civilizational superiority complex as well. You know, India gave China Buddhism, for instance, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and yet there's a, a increasingly over the last 20, 30 years, a recognition that China has just forged ahead materially beyond India. Um, and that gap is growing. So we also harbor a kind of superiority, inferiority complex. So I think this is a, a very stern test of the two sides, how to get past these uh, perceptions. On the worldviews, I'll just say something very briefly, which is that both sides have three quite important worldviews. On the Indian side, there's the Mandala view, where your neighbor is your enemy and your neighbor's neighbors are your friends. By that uh, token, then 
China must be an enemy because it's a neighbor. Um, then there's a cosmopolitan view coming out of Tagore and Gandhi, um, which I think in, in that view, China is a, another Asian uh, civilization and it can be a friend, there's space for India and China to know each other. Neither Tagore or Gandhi were greater nationalism. And so for them, the larger issue is a kind of civilizational uh, convergence with China, or at least the possibility of it, especially in Tagore, I think. Uh, so that's the most positive of the worldviews. The third is a great power view in India, which really at the end of the day was harbored by Nehru and on the right, si right wing side by Golwalkar of the RSS. Uh, and again, I think Nehru has positive views of China, but he also has uh, very worrying and, and sometimes uh, kind of very uh, um, negative views of China. But in that, you know, uh, he sees Ch China as a great power rival, frankly. Doesn't say so very publicly, but uh, so there's not a great place for China there either. It's a great power rival. Uh, on the Chinese side, there's Tianxia, uh, all under heaven. China is the all under heaven state. And operationally at the heart of that is the tributary system. In that view, India is perhaps one of the biggest tributaries around China. And it could get a certain amount of respect, but it's a kind of a junior partner at best. Then there's Chinese communist views. China always has felt, at least since uh, the 1930s, that it was the true revolutionary power, not even the Soviet Union. And socialist India, to the extent that they accepted India as socialist, was kind of a junior socialist partner at best. So China would lead the revolution against you know, capitalism, and India and the Soviet Union and others would be kind of junior partners in that revolution if it ever came to be. And of course, the Chinese, thirdly, have a great power a worldview as well, and clearly, China is, has only one peer there, and that is the United States, which it will seek to over, over, overtake. India is seen as a kind of, well, aspiring or leading power uh, at best. Um, and so, again, uh, it's a secondary power for China. So out of all these six worldviews, really, it's only the cosmopolitanism of Tagore and Gandhi, I think, that really see a possibility of uh, a perceptual cultural accommodation. And let's note, that it's the only worldview today in India, Tagore Gandhi, which nobody gives much credence to anymore. I mean, it has very little support in, in uh, the popular Indian imagination or even increasingly amongst uh, thinking Indians. So, you know, really uh, at the perceptual worldview level, it's not a great grounds for accommodation, it seems to me. Um, perhaps things could change, but uh, I don't see, you know, uh, in the short to, to, to uh, medium term, uh, at this level, much possibility of, of things getting better. Uh, surely, uh, you know, and, 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 and the understanding of these perceptual differences being both unconscious at one level uh, and instrumental at another uh, are two instances which happened in the last two years. One was the social media uh, you know, friends, uh, in a sense, this this cartoon where the Rama is slaying the dragon, if you remember, uh, you know, after the Galwan crisis. And the second one was where, you know, comparison of the Chinese uh, spaceship with funeral pyres. Uh, that was very, very telling in some sense of the COVID crisis uh, in May this year, uh, in April this year. So completely understand these, these perceptual differences and how, how uh, you know, the kind of... Uh, ignite in some sense uh, the underlying fault lines of sino indian relations. Uh, the second major factor is what you describe as the incongruity of India and China's territorial parameters, whether it concerns their mutually exclusive determinations of the Himalayan frontier or the understanding of Tibet. Uh, the history of the border dispute and claims and counterclaims from both sides is well documented. Uh, however, in my uh, opinion, the book makes some very interesting historical and conceptual arguments. Uh, on why both sides have not been able to settle their territorial parameters, even when there have been extensive negotiations and even moments of positive political cons consolidation, which you note in the book, in their bilateral relations. Can you please elaborate on these factors? Yeah, so the uh, kind of the, the amateur historian in me tried to just tell the kind of this happened and then this happened and then this happened and so on and so forth. Uh, which I think is quite important for a general reader to be led through that chronology and some of the twists and turns and the stories and so on. But towards the end of the chapter, I do put on my kind of you know political science hat and try to get a bit more analytical than, than earlier and try and get at why it didn't 
you know, uh, 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 lead to negotiations that uh, ultimately were successful. I mean, there was cooperative um, possibilities. There was an attempt to cooperate and it repeatedly sort of failed uh, on Tibet, on the border, and even on trying to establish military stability. I mean, those are three things that that, that chapter on uh, perimeters looks at on territory. One of the factors I identify in my political science kind of hat is this issue of trust. So I say, and it's a bit of a throwaway line, a lazy line. I say, well, a lack of trust did not allow them to cooperate. But of course that's tautological, which is it's a, it's a circular argument. Uh, if you lack trust, you can't get to cooperation. And if you don't cooperate, how can you establish trust? So, you know, the, the relationship between trust and cooperation just becomes circular, it doesn't tell you much. But tautologies, as we know, can be instructive because they force you once you recognize them to try and unpack them. So my question here, which I think has become a bit clearer to me after the book was written is, well, why the lack of trust? And so let me try out four or five ideas, which some of which are partly in the book, some of which are not so well said. I think the first one is, again, a bit of a tautology, but uh, it's that trust begets trust. So if you have a history, a long history of interaction where there were instances of trust, um, then you, know, you, can, you can go back to that. You have, let's say even back to ancient times or even before the war of uh, 1962 uh, in more modern times, there were instances where the two sides trusted each other and uh, came to a happy place. Then you know, there's a kind of sense that, okay, we can trust each other when things go bad. Unfortunately, um, you know, these are two civilization or states, if you want, separated by geography, by the Himalayas, and the two central uh, kind of um, empires there uh, had very little contact directly. I mean, Beijing to or the capital of China at various points with the imperial headquarters, with the imperial headquarters say, in northern India or when uh, empire in India was further south. Um, they didn't have a lot of interactions. And so that ability to build trust over uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, I mean, doesn't really uh, occur, unlike say China's interactions with the rest of East Asia um, and other parts of Asia, um, nor were they allies. And this is the chapter that I have on the modern partnerships after 1949. India and China have never been allies against a third party, the United States or the Soviet Union or Russia. The Chinese partnered those two great powers against each other, and India partnered both of them, that is the Soviet Union, the United States against China, but India and China never partnered against. And this is important because when your allies or very close strategic partners against a third party, you know, your military high commands, your political high commands, uh, they interact very, very closely. Otherwise you can't have a strategic partnership. You can't have a, a coordination in war and grand strategy if your highest level people are not in intimate kind of contact. But we were never strategic partners or allies in that sense. And our military elites and our political elites never had that kind of intimacy. So that's one, trust begets trust and we, didn't, we don't have that history. I think trust also in our common sense, we have a, 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 a reckoning that trust comes from kind of similar culture because culture is what? It's a, an interpretive schema whereby I know what you mean when you do certain things. You don't have to spell it out for me. Um, there's a kind of cognitive convergence, there's predictability. I know from being in the same culture that a stimulus uh, or an action by me will elicit a certain kind of action from you, right? Um, and uh, India and China are not part of the same culture. I don't mean they're completely divorced, Buddhism affected China, Chinese influences came over to India, they traded, they, and so on and so forth. But the fact is that I think anyone who's been to China from India or Chinese people who come to India can see quite readily that there are all kinds of cultural uh, differences here. Um, and so that's the, the kind of deep structure. And then if you look at post-1949, you can sort of see that even the political culture, forget about classical or popular culture, but even the political culture of the two was not very close. Nehru, take an example, post-1949, Nehru and his colleagues, I show in the book, or I, I assert, were liberal, legalistic in their political culture. 
Mao and his colleagues were revolutionaries who fought a civil war and a war against the Japanese. And they were very strategic. India, Indians leaders and elites were lawyers and you know, constitutionalists. They took norms and, and law very seriously. These communist Chinese leaders thought that norms are a cover up and institutions are a cover up for the, the ruling class. So, you know, they're not on the same page in a political cultural sense either. Then trust thirdly comes from delivering on commitments. If you promised me something in the past and you kept to those commitments, then I'll trust you or trust you more. But at least the example of Tibet in 1955, 56 or thereabout shows that both sides thought that they hadn't kept to commitments. They signed uh, and were in agreement on Tibet in 1950, and then again in the famous 1954 agreement between the two sides. But the Chinese thought that uh, India was collaborating with the Americans in fostering the Tibetan rebellion and had gone back on the 54 understanding. And the Indians thought that China's commitment in 50 and 54 to treating Tibet as an autonomous province or autonomous region was being undermined by policies actually on the ground. And so uh, Nehru thought that China had gone back on its commitments. So it's just an example of where both sides thought that they'd, they weren't to be trusted because they didn't keep to promises. Next point, you know, cognitive, oh, so that's the trust factor, okay? Those are reasons why there wasn't trust. But it is two other factors that you kindly pointed out, uh, which I make. One is this cognitive dissonance. You know, India and China are not the only countries, but there's a tendency for leadership's decision makers to resist any discrepant information that comes in. Uh, so someone might be offering you cooperation, but you see it as non-cooperative. And you can't change your mind because you, you kind of just have a mindset that they're being non-cooperative. Um, where does that come from? Why were both sides so steadily and why are they still uh, afflicted by cognitive dissonance? And I think part of the answer is that actually, oddly, they're both weak states. Uh, this is a strange thing to say about perhaps China, but I mean this in the sense that they're highly centralized and personalized. And Mao and his successors and Nehru and his successors uh, coming to Xi Jinping and Modi, they're not people who listened a lot to advisors beyond a very small kitchen cabinet. And civil society, think tanks, the media, the press, I mean, look at Xi and Modi today. They're magisterial personalities who are not prone to listen to people around them. They direct and others listen. They're not known for a consultative style, but not just them. Uh, their, their predecessors were like that too, including Nehru and Mao. So, you know, there's going to be cognitive dissonance when there aren't checks and balances in thinking. Um, and lastly, I think both sides had this zero sum view of security and that's why negotiations repeatedly fail. I mean, with territory, in any case, you tend to have a zero sum. If I give you this territory, then you've lost and I've, I've gained, I mean, the other way around, you've gained, I've lost. But it doesn't have to be that way. And the swap between India and China could have been a win-win. Uh, it didn't happen for various reasons, but I think the lack of trust intervened here too. Um, and I think the other point that I don't make in the book, which has struck me later, is that, you know, the zero sum view of security comes from, you know, a larger kind of strategic setting. China could have felt that if it gave in too easily on territory to India, you know, that after all, they have to take care of the Taiwan issue. Uh, later, there was the South China Sea issue. There's the territorial issue with the Japanese. For years, there was the territorial issue with uh, the Soviet Union. If they gave in too easily to India, and by the way, Arunachal Pradesh is 89,000 square kilometers. That's twice the size of Taiwan. So, you know, uh, that might be the slippery slope for China and other quarrels. Likewise, India had the Kashmir problem above all. If we gave in too easily to China on territorial issues, wouldn't the Pakistanis get a sense that, you know, India might eventually give in on Kashmir as well? So I think, you know, the zero sum view of security, particularly when it relates to territory, if you have other territorial quarrels, there's a chance that you'll become very zero sum minded because you fear that it'll af affect your bargaining situation, uh, your bargaining strength in other quarrels. Right, yeah, reputational concerns become extremely yeah. important. Uh, Thank you, that's the word I was looking for and you said no, it. definitely. Uh, and you said it in one word and it took me 15 minutes. But <laughs> I'll learn from you, Kanti. <laughs> no, I think I'll learn brevity from you. Uh, so uh, re regarding, you know, I want to 
when I was reading through the book, I did feel, you know, you mentioned the history of strategic partnership as a variable in building trust, but it's doing much more for you in the book. It's a variable in itself, which kind of explains uh, not only the lack of trust, but, you know, uh, this, this capability to somewhere down the line reconcile and compromise, uh, sacrifice, build consensus, so to say. Uh, uh, so my point is that India and China have often been on the positional ends of global balances of power and minimal history of experience of give and take, which you outline in the book. However, given the fundamental nature of their clashing interests, whether concerning perceptions of great power ambitions or their material interests, the first two variables, this could have been the natural course of course in any case. Uh, so why should we then give so much emphasis to the lack of partnerships as a variable in sino indian relations? Uh, moreover, aren't we also denying agency to India and China uh, by saying that maybe the great powers manipulated them to be each other's adversaries during the Cold War or even in the contemporary period, so to say? Yeah, thanks for that, Yogesh. And I think you in a very uh, polite and nice way have drawn attention to some of the weakest parts of the book. And I think this is a chapter that I think could have been, um, could have been better written, but in the under the pressure of time, I think uh, it wasn't as, as crisp and penetrating as it could have been, sadly. But uh, let me try again, uh, in a sense, to uh, address uh, what you're pointing to. I mean, I think the first point, I mean, the point that is made in the chapter is that, and I, th I think I made it a bit earlier too in this talk, is that, you know, uh, the strategic partnerships and the disjuncture there, the fact that India and China were never on the same side, I think that's important for, why they haven't been able to be more cooperative, why they're not friends, which is the subtitle of the book. Uh, being on the same side strategically, as I said, you know, builds links between the elites, the, the military strategic elites, political elites, and their understanding of each other. And that builds a kind of certain amount of intellectual and social capital. So that when you do get into conflict, and as neighbors, you're likely to, neighbors often have points of friction over territory and all kinds of other stuff. You know, that could have been a ballast. You could have drawn on that capital to work your way through periods of tension and conflict so that, you know, you, you, you kind of came out to a good place. But we didn't have it between India and China, unfortunately, because we were never on the same side. And so in a way that's restating your point, but I think it's trying to link up to why not being on the same side you know, became a problem related to other issues. And as you say, a kind of independent variable on, on, on the relationship. Um, the second is, I mean, I use a bit of jargony, social science ty type of language to, uh, by drawing attention to what I call endogenous factors and exogenous factors within the four powers that I look at in this chapter of partnerships. That is the Soviet Union, the United States, China, and India. Uh, the <laughs> the original quad, if you like, not a cooperative quad, but a, a geopolitical quad. And um, what I mean by endogenous and exogenous factors there is that how India and China didn't come out on the same side was partly determined endogenously, that is developments between the four themselves. Um, and then there were exogenous factors, that is outside of these, the relationship between these four, there sometimes there were developments that affected affected them and there, thereby also affected India-China bilateral issues. Um, and they both tended to work uh, such that India and China were never on the same side. So just, I mean, to clarify that rather uh, abstract statement, I mean, just some examples might help. I mean, take the exogenous. Uh, were there things between the four that sometimes drove them into different camps or almost always did? Um, so exogenous, things outside the four. The best example I think I gave there was 1971, the problem between West Pakistan and East Pakistan. I mean, it had nothing to do with India-China relations, had nothing to do with global geopolitics initially. It was an internal problem of Pakistan. It blew up into a civil war um, and India got involved. And out of that um, came, you know, um, the fact that um, uh, the United States happened to uh, given its own rapprochement with China simultaneously, uh, choose a certain side. The, the Chinese chose to uh, effect a rapprochement with China at the same uh, with the United States at the same time. And India found itself naturally on the other side, given the problems 
that were impinging on it from the Bang developing Bangladesh story. And India was driven due to the rapprochement between China and the US into the hands of the Soviet Union. So here's a problem that begins exogenously in Pakistan, nothing to do with the quadrilateral initially, uh, but that affects the quadrilateral uh, because the Americans, uh, even though they're uncomfortable with what's going on in, in Pakistan, uh, because of the rapprochement with China, they want to show the Chinese that they stick by allies. After all, they want to become an ally, alliance partner now of China. And to show that, you know, they have to uh, show the Indians that they're going to stick with the Pakistanis. They've got to, you know, take sides. Um, so, you know, and, and once India feels abandoned by uh, the United States that it had, you know, kind of implicitly relied on against China all these years, it was forced into the uh, uh, August Treaty, uh, 25 years strategic partnership with uh, the Soviet Union. Um, so that's an example of an exogenous. I mean, there are other ones, um, you know, uh, India's uh, getting uh, closer to the United States, for instance, at various times. It's not all been China driven, uh, particularly in the last 20 years, it's been driven by India wanting to access American technology, American arms, American investments in uh, American markets. Um, China too. Uh, the one relationship I don't deal with in the book is China-Pakistan. Um, but, you know, I think we in India think that China's interest in Pakistan is only driven really by its desire to balance India and the subcontinent. But China has interests in Pakistan that go much beyond India. It's uh, uh, the, one of the biggest Muslim states in the world. Uh, it eventually developed nuclear weapons, which China helped develop. Um, but it saw Pakistan as a an important military strategic partner in the Islamic world. Um, it saw its location next to areas like the Gulf and Afghanistan and Iran, which was important. Um, China also received things from Pakistan. We forget that AQ Khan, the head of the Pakistani nuclear program, shared the Dutch centrifuge technology that he stole from the Dutch. He gave it to the Chinese. They didn't have it. He allowed the Chinese, well, not he, the Pakistani government, almost certainly allowed Beijing also to reverse engineer American arms that it had got uh, from, from the United States uh, during uh, the Cold War. So, you know, the, the Chinese had an interest in Pakistan that had nothing much to do with India at all. So that's, those are exogenous factors that had nothing to do with the quadrilateral. Endogenously, obviously, the, as I said, the US rapprochement in China, um, it, it wasn't really related to uh, India, the US rapprochement, but once it happened, it set off a certain dynamic. Uh, and that was a kind of endogenous then factor that continued to brew. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, a long answer to your question is that, yeah, there's a kind of inbuilt structural dynamic that would have asserted itself such that India and China would probably have always been on uh, the opposite side. Um, but, uh, you know, it's complicated because they were both exogenous and endogenous. So, you know, it, it became even more sort of structurally determined, uh, even more difficult for India and China ever to be on the same side. There were exogenous forces that were pushing them apart and there were endogenous forces that were pushing them apart. Um, and when you get both, then I think it's difficult to find yourself on the same side. Right. Thank you for pointing out the China-Pakistan thing, which I didn't really miss in the book. And maybe rightly so, because, you know, I was looking at the underlying deeper engagement between India and China and kind of, you know, that trope of China-Pakistan, which is more of a consequence rather than a cause, uh, you know, of, uh, of Sino-Indian relations in a sense. Uh, but the second thing which I also noticed was, you know, your use of this squad of balances, uh, you know, balancing behavior between three of the major Eurasian powers in some sense, and one of the offshore power, I think it's equally applicable today, uh, you know, and that I think is a very refreshing, uh, you know, uh, understanding of how India and China uh, are so important to the global balances of power and what they do then becomes, uh, you know, uh, largely related to uh, international politics rather than just, uh, you know, uh, submitted to the regional dynamics of it. Uh, so I, I really like that chapter. Uh, uh, moving on, uh, you argue in the book uh, that along with perceptions, if you are given a choice, uh, this asymmetry of power perhaps is the biggest difference uh, driving the antagonistic nature of the Sino-Indian relations. 
Uh, you have explained in the book how this changes the dynamic of settlement for India and China. However, this has also this also has consequences for India's foreign national security behavior. Can you explain to our audience how the asymmetry of power is fundamentally changing the parameters of the Sino-Indian relationship and what choices India has to address this growing disparity? Where does the US fit into India's requirements? Yeah, I guess uh, th this is the part of the book that has occasioned quite a lot of discussion uh, everywhere. And um, I think uh, in India particularly, we do in our gut understand that this asymmetry is important, that it's growing, it's very, very, sometimes quite galling to us in India, uh, I think, uh, and to Indian analysts, but it's an existential fact now. Um, and what does it mean to the relationship? I mean, I think the, the fundamental point I try to make in the chapter about the asymmetry is that um, it's led to a, a conclusion in, in China that because they're so powerful, they don't have to make a concession to India, let's say on the border or our feelings over UN a Security Council membership or uh, being a permanent member or our admission into the national security, uh, I'm sorry, the nuclear, nuclear um, uh, the NSG um, and, and other forums. So I think um, that's the, the feeling of the Chinese side. On the Indian side, given the asymmetry, India feels it can't concede. The Chinese feel they don't have to. Uh, the Indians feel they can't because of their weakness, because any concession, would uh, risk being seen as a strategic surrender. And it might cause the Chinese to take more advantage of India. And there's a domestic uh, and international kind of blowback, which is that, I mean, it looked like India surrendered essentially. Um, and so I think Indian leaderships, elites simply cannot countenance uh, at this stage, at least until the gap uh, narrows that they could make any fundamental concession to China. So I think that's the way I connect the asymmetry to uh, the problem of this kind of stalemate between the two sides. Um, now, you know, this is historically unprecedented. It's never been the case that India and China have been so far apart, so unequal. Um, there are times when China was, and we have facts and figures that are debatable, uh, the Angus Madigan, Madison kind of reconstruction of economic history, but it's never been the case through 2000 years, uh, if we were to believe those uh, facts and figures, that the two have been so far apart. I mean, today China's GDP uh, is five times India's size. And if this carries on, uh, you know, I mean, uh, sadly, India will be to China what Pakistan is to China. Maybe one sixth or one seventh or one eighth the size of China. I mean, you know, uh, uh, we've got to look this problem as Indians, at least, uh, I think, squarely in the eye. Um, and uh, so, what are the choices then? I mean, one choice is when you're uh, confronted with such a massive asymmetry is that you bandwagon. You accept your, uh, the fact that you're massively behind in, in terms of power and you become a junior partner. So uh, that's one logical possibility. But I think obviously India is simply not civilizationally, politically ready for that. Uh, and that's quite understandable because it sees itself as a major world civilization and it was and it is. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to countenance that India could bandwagon ever. Um, the second possibility is the Deng Xiaoping possibility, uh, which is kind of a variant of bandwagoning, if you like. It's hide and buy. Um, and so uh, I think probably most recently, General H.S. Panag in India has kind of flirted with that in a recent article. Uh, others have uh, possibly ad adverted to it obliquely, uh, which is that India, you know, seeks to uh, avoid confronting China. It doesn't make any big concessions, but it avoids antagonizing. It lays low. It doesn't challenge China on all kinds of issues very prominently. It avoids an outright, let's say, alliance or strategic partnership with the United States and others that China might find awkward. Um, and it uh, goes along uh, with economic and other ties. This is what China did with the United States. It kept a low profile didn't uh, challenge American leadership globally, profited from American technology and economic access to the American market, et cetera, et cetera, to build up its power. Hide yourself, bide your time. So that's a form of bandwagoning uh, for the long term. Uh, but again, I mean, I think uh, this is a possibility. 
but it's hard to see that any, and, and you could say that in some ways India has done that over the last 15 or 20 years um, without saying it publicly because it would be so difficult for us to accept that. Uh, but there's some element of that I think that one can probably see, although it's, it's probably blown up with the confrontations over the last five years and of course the events of last summer. Um, the other is internal balancing, which is a fancy name for build up your own strength. Uh, and I think the real game here for India is economic. Uh, because economic power is the most fungible. I mean, you could do internal balancing by just building up your military. And the gap between India and China militarily, arguably, and I, I, I say this in the book, is not as big as the gap that is economic. Um, and so since economic power is more fungible, that is, it's easily translated into other forms of power, such as military, maybe that's the one that you really need to fix first. Um, but the book kind of comes out saying, Look, all three elements of power, and I haven't talked about soft power yet. So there's economic power and military power, which together combine into hard power. And then the third element of power is soft power, the power of persuasion, getting others to do what you want them to do by persuading them, by attracting them. Um, and in all three India lags, but the gap varies. You know, the temptation is to think that if we just fix one element, economic power or military power or soft power, then you know, that might do it. But the fact is that actually you need a comprehensive approach to power and because the three elements interact. If you don't have economic power, you probably can't build long-term sustainable military power. And if you don't have economic and military power, your claims to the soft power, frankly, and this is somewhat the weakness, I think, of some soft power theorizing uh, is pretty hollow. You don't have a hard power, you can't back up your soft power. And the reverse is true too, to some extent, which is if you don't have the power of persuasion, you must constantly use your hard power to get what you want. So you're wasting hard power resources when if you cultivate your soft power, you can use soft power instead and you conserve your hard power for when you need it. So I think soft power, also contributes to your power. Uh, so you have to cultivate all three if you want a nice, well-rounded approach to comprehensive power. Um, and so I think, you know, on internal balancing, you've got to build all three. Last thing is if there's a huge gap in power initially or in the, in the uh, while you build internal power, you build external power. That is, you borrow power from friends and allies. And here, obviously, the United States, which is your point, is obviously the, the one power that could really help India. But I would say that, you know, the question marks around sometimes the way the Americans can help and then sometimes abandon their allies is, you know, the lesson from that is that probably the best thing the United States can do is, as it did in, in a sense for China, is help build India's economy, its technology, uh, its kind of diplomatic engagements in the world more than, you know, uh, being a, a power that can really come to India's rescue, if there, particularly if there's a land war. Um, and I think that's the biggest uh, benefit. From India's perspective, I think the other benefit is, and this may be what India is kind of doing quite subtly, uh, and may account for sometimes the ambivalence that people see in India's policies towards the United States. And that is that, you know, having in the United States as a kind of putative strategic partner, flirting almost with becoming a, a quasi ally or ally is actually what generates diplomatic uh, power vis-a-vis -vis China. It's the threat that Delhi could defect completely to Washington's side, you know, that keeps Beijing in some kind of a quandary and increases Delhi's bargaining power. I don't make this point very strongly in the book, but it's come home to me more, I think, that you know, uh, this is something that weaker powers can do. They kind of are ambivalent or hedge between two bigger powers, and they use the threat of defection either side to warn those two powers that if they're pushed against the wall by either power, they'll defect to the other side altogether. And I think Delhi is has been trying, and that might account for some of the ambivalence people see sometimes and the, the, the head scratching that goes on about, well, why has Delhi committed altogether to Washington? Well, Delhi wonders about Washington's reliability, but it also you know, has its own sense of who Delhi is or who India is. It doesn't want to be a junior partner to anyone and be taken for granted by anyone. And so this kind of flirting with defection is a way of generating power. Um, 
So um, I think that's an important kind of way in which external balancing operates as well. No, definitely. Um, and some of that is visible even during the Cold War period in a sense. You know, so in, in yeah, that's one view of non-alignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, especially even after, you know, 1971, the treaty with Soviet Union, India is dangling the Soviet threat to China to kind of, you know, cozy, kind of normalize relationships. So I think that's a very pertinent point which you raise, you know, how you use, uh, you know, uh, the balances as such uh, in your own favor and for signaling uh, to your adversary in a sense. Uh, so on the concluding note, you make a very perceptive point that states become great powers. Uh, not because of resource endowments alone or historical contingencies, but because they exhibit a will to power. And this requires the state to pursue, uh, in your words, a systematic social effort to produce power. Do you think that the Indian state has realized the challenge of China's rights? And is the current political dispensation in New Delhi willing to undertake the reforms, sacrifices, and consensus building needed to level the gap with India's Himalayan neighbor? Yes, I mean, I do think that uh, India has realized the power gap for quite a long time. But I guess the point was that realizing the gap is just not enough. Um, you have to have a more fundamental, dedicated kind of commitment to closing that gap. Um, it's not enough to beat yourself up uh, over the gap. And I think that's more or less what India has done periodically, which is translated into a certain amount of kind of self-denigration. And again, that's understandable, uh, but I think that's not enough. And I think Manjuri Chatterjee Miller's recent book uh, on how countries become a great power makes the point that, uh, and I reference it, uh, I read bits of it just as the, I was finishing writing the book, that, you know, she compares various great powers as they became great powers and says, you know, you kind of, it's not, to, not her language, but kind of Nietzschean will to power is necessary, you know, you've got to really want it. And that means, a certain kind of set of sort of social arrangements and strategies and, and so on in a very dedicated way to get you there. Um, and so I finished the book with kind of asking whether India can make that kind of effort, you know, and I say it won't be very easy. I mean, it's not enough to do economic reform. So sometimes when we look at this gap, the people say, oh, yeah, India should do this economic reform to catch up a la 1991, the next uh, or Atman Nirbhartha, let's all go full fledged on, you know, um, kind of a, a self reliance strategy uh, now. Uh, and on the soft power side, uh, gosh, we should entice tourists and foreign students who will then be entranced by Indian civilization or grateful to India and, you know, uh, be persuaded by us and love us. I mean, those are all rather piecemeal things, and they don't tell us why any of those things will happen how we could galvanize to do these fundamental reforms, how we could be truly self-reliant when 70 years we haven't managed to do it, and how we could you know, kind of suddenly become open to foreign uh, students and become attractive as a destination. And I end up sort of saying, you know, I mean, I, I, I would admit some, somewhat throwing my hands up a little bit and sort of saying, uh, we need civilizational change here. Um, and China had it, uh, it had it, through um, you know, uh, its civil war, its war against the Japanese, uh, and then the coming of communism and the huge uh, kind of turmoil and turbulence that, and changes that were introduced by uh, Mao and, and the revolution. Um, and at one point I say, well, you know, total warfare um, can bring about this kind of revolutionary change where society and the state becomes fused towards some great security goal and, and, uh, and building of power. Now, obviously I'm not wishing total warfare on India. I mean, it is interesting that the only region of Asia, leave aside Central Asia, that was not visited by total warfare was South Asia because the Japanese were stopped at Burma essentially, uh, at Myanmar. All the rest of Asia uh, was visited by, uh, by total warfare. And that sadly, or, or whatever, one of the consequences of that was that certain num types of social reform occurred there that led on or had implications for economic growth and change and social emancipation. And that didn't happen in South Asia. So it, this civilizational change has to come out of, of some other kind of real galvanizing of our own society in India. And 
you know, I say that we're going to need, you know, a thoroughgoing emancipation of Indian society, emancipation of people from rural traditional life. You can't build a great power, a modern, you know, uh, society where society where where uh, civil society and the state are fused in good ways, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the backs of a rural society, just has never been done. And it's not going to be done in India. So yeah, you have to have an emancipation of people from the rural areas into the urban. You have to emancipate people from, you know, very traditional outlooks uh, into modern life, which is mostly urban life. You have to emancipate people from the bad hold of caste and of certain kinds of religious prejudices and, and so on. Uh, you have to build a scientific experimental society. You know, I think we know this in our hearts, but we haven't through our education system, through educational reform, through social reform, through political reform done it. And if we don't do it, frankly, you can't. I mean, India still has, just to take an example, I mean, we're at about 36, 37, 38% uh, urban population. That's one of the lowest figures in Asia. Yeah, China is over 50% today. The rest of Asia, pretty much all has gone over 50%. Uh, I think even Pakistan, Bangladesh, maybe slightly ahead of us in urbanization, but leave aside South Asia. So, you know, we're just not there in terms of a modern, urban, experimental, emancipated society. Uh, and we're still kind of dreaming of this wonderful rural life that will be some sort of almost Gandhian lifestyle. You can't build a great power on that. Um, and, you know, all the economic change we wish for, and all of that has to be done at a time when the world is kind of moving away from globalization and uh, openness to economic interchange. Uh, I mean, it's not the end of globalization, but it's certainly a pulling back from. Um, and, and the other is that we have to do all this at a time of enormous planetary unprecedented planetary change, which is climate change. China uh, profited from export-led growth in a globalized world economy and from a world where you know, pl planetary change ecologically was not so severe for 30 years. We are beginning our real economic journey and the possibility of it when neither of those things is available to us. Not the kind of economic openness and we're facing the real effects of climate change, which you're seeing every day now, everywhere in the world. So the challenges to us of emancipating ourselves, economic reform, building a new society are all happening at a time of enormous difficulties for India. It'll take nothing less than a civilizational change. I don't mean a going back to some golden age in India, but forwards to what I call, you know, an ecological, least sustainable and emancipated and an experimental, that is a scientific modern society. It can be done, but it will really take Indian elites, uh, you know, to uh, rethink their place in the world and their role in Indian society. Surely, uh, you know, I think you out in your concluding chapter, as you did, you know, even in your concluding thoughts, outline those challenges which India faces. But also, you know, I, I, I understand and I agree with the point that it's the need for some kind of catharsis, uh, you know, in the way India thinks and operates um, at all levels, as you described, you know, uh, and most of them in some sense are internal problems which can be resolved through internally through the will to power, which you underlined very nicely in your concluding chapter. Professor Bajpai, thank you so much for helping us understand the underlying sources of Sino-Indian divergence and its consequences, not only for New Delhi and Beijing, but for global politics. Personally, I have learned a lot over the last 50 to 55 minutes of this discussion as I've always through our interactions. And I'm sure our listeners from around the world would share my assessment. You were logged on to the bookshelf to learn more about our work, please visit us at ices.nus.edu.st. Thank you.